Hello and welcome to The Stoics. This week is our third instalment in the series and we are going to be looking at Seneca. Um, greetings everyone, uh, this is enough uh, a session of The Stoics from a sofa and this week we're going to look at possibly um, yours, certainly one of my uh, favourite writers, philosophers in the entire Western tradition, Seneca. Now he's quite a mixed figure. And over the next hour or so, we're going to be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of his thought, of his status in philosophy, and what it means to uh, use our time well. So hopefully we'll be using our time well by exploring this. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so our agenda is as follows. We are going to begin by thinking about who Seneca was. Um, uh, who Seneca as an individual, um, Seneca's life, which was you know uniquely publicly committed, um, and then his his bit of his reputation as well. Because the focus shouldn't just be on Seneca, we need to try and keep Seneca um, within the frame of the um, context of Stoic philosophy that we have sketched out in the last two weeks. The early Stoa, the middle Stoa, the late Stoa. Who are the late Stoa? How does Seneca fit into that? We're then going to look at Seneca's philosophy as a Stoic, as a self-professed Stoic. Um, here we're going to be look, getting a slightly broader view than just the text for this week, which was The Shortness of Life. Fantastic work, uh, short and very stimulating. We're going to spend a bit of time thinking about the arguments of this. And then at the end, and we're going to kind of do this work throughout, we're going to think about Seneca's legacy. Why is he so interesting? Why is he so important? Why is there always, possibly in every century, um, a turn back to Seneca. What's he trying to teach us? And it's something that I'm going to sketch out here, uh, possibly controversially, um, and it's something I want us to discuss. Is Seneca actually a really bad Stoic philosopher? What do I mean by that? Well, this is something that we're going to get to and I'm going to flesh out as we go along. Maybe he was a great philosopher, but maybe actually he's a very bad Stoic. This needs some development, so we'll get to that. All right, <clears throat> in our first week, we met uh, Seneca, um, he was one of our dram dramatist personae um, at the start of the first class. Now we met Seneca as he was reflecting about life in Corsica, where he has been sent in exile, sent as a form of punishment. And whilst he's in Corsica, and it's kind of a rocky, beautiful place, um, he writes these consolations, he writes these letters to various people, one of them is his mother, uh, Helvia, and he's, um, you know, kind of telling her, you know, don't fear, don't worry, recognise what really counts. Now, I want to begin with a, with a quotation that we had there, but let's go back to it again here, because it's a nice way of framing what makes Seneca interesting. And Seneca says, God himself is beyond suffering evil. You are above it. Despise poverty. No man lives as poor as he was born. Despise pain. Either it will cease or you will cease. Despise death, it either ends you or takes you elsewhere. Despise fortune, I have given her no weapon that can reach the mind. Now there's something really wonderful about Seneca's prose, and maybe this might be the first stoic writing of this course so far where you've probably had a breathe of self relief. Um, because the writing isn't isn't so dense, it flows and it is it's exhorting us, it's addressed to us. It's addressed to real concerns. It seems to speak to the public in the way that we might, and I encourage you to imagine the Stoics speaking to the public when they were, um, when Zeno of Scythium uh, was in the Stoa Poikile, in the painted porch, you know, right by the Agora. This is about how we live. This isn't just abstract concerns about cosmic fire, an active principle, or, you know, living with nature. What does that even mean? This is about how we deal with fortune, how we deal with adversity. And Seneca seems to have a lot to say about it. And he, <laughs> he's even more relevant in what he has to say because of all of the fortune and misfortune he endured in his life. Now, there's something that we also need to say about Corsica and the time of Corsica, which, you know, there's more than meets the eye here. We'll get to that. Let's talk about his life first of all. Let's talk about Seneca. Now, a good way to begin with Seneca um, is the way... Um, it's the way that many thought about Seneca in the Renaissance period, and we're going to look at the Renaissance reception of Stoic philosophy um, later in this course. And that's in terms of his death. 
Now we might remember from Diogenes Laertius last week that how a philosopher dies is really important. In a way that is the um, test ground for um, the relevance and their own adherence to what they thought. Now some deaths were involved a powerful inhuman level of self-control. We might remember Zeno's death, he just holds his breath and dies. Cleantes, he starves himself. Chrysippus, well he either drinks too much or is that story with the figs. Now Seneca has a model death, but is it a model death? Let's, let's look at it as a model death. So Seneca dies in 65 CE, we sometimes say 65 AD, nowadays we call it CE, common era because it's got less Christian associations. He dies in 65 CE. Um, we think he's probably about 60 or slightly younger at this point. Now he takes his own life. He's forced to take his own life by the Emperor Nero. And his death is sometimes seen as an example of a death where the mind frees itself from adversity and faces de death with tranquility and um, equanimity, with kind of a sense of um, self-control. So what happens first of all? Well, we see the image in the bath. Well, Seneca, up until this point, has been first the tutor of the young Emperor Nero and then a very important advisor. In the previous two, three years before his death here, he has withdrawn from political life. He's dedicated his life more to philosophy. He's, he's fallen out of political favour as well. Now, there is a conspiracy to assassinate Nero and Seneca is implicated in it. So one evening when he's dining with his wife Paulina and two friends, the death sentence comes. He must take his own life. So what does he do? Well, first of all, Seneca um, tries to change his will so that um, his friends, his family um, get all of his kind of his goods. But this isn't allowed. Like, I'm not sure why, but it's forbidden. So basically all his goods are probably going to go to the emperor instead. As we'll find out later, this is actually a lot of stuff. Um, so he tries to change his will in his friend's favour, but this isn't allowed. So then he decides that he's going uh, to follow the instructions. He's going to take his own life. Now, in this, he's got somebody in mind, of course, Socrates. Socrates, corrupting the youth of Athens, charged with impiety, decides to face death bravely. He's not going to flee. He's not going to go into exile. He's going to follow the instructions. And Seneca does the same. So he and his wife, Paulina, um, decide to cut the wrists. <sighs> but it doesn't really go that smoothly. Um, Seneca is, has been unwell. He's been unwell. He's a poor health throughout his life. And he is said to have quite a frugal lifestyle. And this is used to explain that, plus his age, is used to explain the fact that his blood circulation is very poor. So he cuts his wrists, but he doesn't die. He cuts his veins in his knees, in his legs, but he's not dying. He's in great pain, but he's not dying. So as the blood is kind of draining away and he's kind of losing, you know, losing some consciousness, he starts, he asks one of his servants to transcribe his thoughts. And that's what we see in this image here, just on the left. But it's not working. He then asks a friend to bring some hemlock, hemlock being Socrates' choice of real, literal poison. But the hemlock doesn't have effect. His circulation is so slow and it's already got worse because it's you know, cut a lot of his veins. So then he sits in a hot bath, and this is part of this image, where he said that he suffocates, you know, he kind of very slowly dies in the hot bath. Now, you might think this doesn't sound like a great way to go, does it at all? And that's because Seneca seems to face this slow and very painful suicide with even-mindedness without despair, with a kind of courage. Now, according to one academic, Timothy Hill, his death is proof of, quote, his ability to, to divorce himself from the influence of externals. Now, that's a very interesting idea. But other students of Seneca have said, hold on a minute, maybe there's something here that's actually quite stage managed. That Seneca was one of the most prominent figures in public life in this time. The account, the story, the events of his death would immediately become publicised and very well known. 
And so for, so for the Roman historian Tacitus, he says, maybe this is a kind of an exercise in public relations. This is taking control of, quote, the image of his life. This is Seneca trying to control and transmit the image of his life and his death to posterity. And it works. It's a very powerful image. So may, again, there's something that we're going to see more and more here. There's more than meets the eye. Extreme self-control, extreme courage. He influences Socrates, but maybe someone that's quite managed too. Managed and then not well managed. A struggle to control the image of his life. So this is what we're going to find with Seneca. There's more than meets the eye. There's possibly even two Senecas. Right, let's meet this man and let's explore his world. So we need to think about what's happening in the Roman world in which Seneca emerges. So last week when we were thinking about um, the early Stoa, when we were thinking about um, Zeno, Scythium and Cleantes and Crispus, we were dealing with a, a, a Stoic school that was based in Athens in ancient Greece. Now towards the end of this period, we know that culture and philosophy shifts it shifts from Greece to Rome. Now, why is that? Now, probably quite loosely, you're thinking, well, that this must reflect the greater military power and prestige of Rome. And that's true. Rome does become the, the superpower of the Mediterranean in this period. But it also follows um, a failed rebellion, I guess we could say, in which the Greek states, um, places like Athens, decide uh, to come together in a, in a league, the Achaean League, in an uprising against what is then the Roman Republic. There is the Achaean Wars um, in the 140s BC, um, and the Greeks lose, basically. The Greeks lose, and as a result, kind of power and everything starts shifting to Rome. Now, this happens in different ways. So the Romans, um, while they completely destroyed the city of Corinth, which you can see on this map here, they also dam badly damaged um, Athens as well. And it seems that from this point, 146 BC, um, that um, from this point, the, the philosophical schools in Athens closed down. So kind of Greek, Greek political power kind of ends pretty much with this. But what about Greek cultural power, Greek hegemony, we might say? That still exists, but the schools have moved. The schools have pushed away. Now, we only looked at them quite briefly, but we looked at the figures of um, Panaikius and Posidonius, and we're going to come back to them a bit later. Um, the figures of the Middle Stoic school, the Middle Stoa. Now, um, Panaikius heads the school, the Stoic school, and then Posidonius kind of takes over later, but Posidonius leaves some Stoic teachings behind. And he also leaves Athens. Posidonius goes to Rhodes. You can see Rhodes also on this map. It's just to the um, it's to the left. It was in between kind of Cyprus and Greece. And Posidonius becomes a friend uh, to important Roman official, to the general Pompey and others. So we have this moment where Greek power is drifting, is disappearing, is entering into a new Roman era. A kind of tragedy. This is a 19th century image of the Battle of Corinth, well, the, of the sack of Corinth when the city of Corinth is destroyed. And we're seeing the emergence of Roman prestige in its place. And this is um, kind of the ruins of the uh, Temple of Saturn and the Roman Forum. But what we need to keep in mind is enough of events in this period. It's not just about Greek loss, but it's about Greek gain and Greek hegemony, Greek intellectual power. A big part of that is gained um, by something that happens just a little bit before the destruction of Corinth. And that is the um, Athenian delegation to Rome in 155 BC. OK, you're thinking, Jesus, it's a lot of facts. Just re remember this from last week, that there is this moment much later on where the, um, the Greeks, Athens, um, send a cultural mission to Rome, and the cultural mission involves three philosophical schools. The academics, which are the successors of Plato, the peripatetics, the walkers, which are the successors of Aristotle, and the Stoics. 
And it's the Stoics in particular that end up being very influential. Led by uh, Diogenes of Babylon. They seem to be kind of um, practicing and preaching a philosophy that is much more attuned to Roman culture. Now in Roman culture there was much more emphasis on the vita activa, on the active life, on an active political life. And therefore much more interest um, for a philosophy that is going to teach us how to live in the here and now and live well in the here and now. Which isn't going to be so concerned with trying to understand the conditions of knowledge, which is what the Platonic school, the academy, had kind of been working on. Nor is it just going to be kind of uh, preaching a kind of life of um, pleasant withdrawal, which we might associate with the Epicureans. Instead, the Stoics and the Painted Porch practice a philosophy which is interested in public life, which sees a duty to the community at its centre, and which looks at, at human life and human contentment in terms of what human beings are by nature. And that by nature is really important. We can think then of how these different things were speaking to the Romans. Now last week we also looked at Cicero. Cicero is not a Stoic, He's, he is an academic, so he's more interested in the um, subsequent f f philosophical legacy of Plato. But Cicero had a lot of time for Stoicism. Uh, he um, was friends with Posidonius, I think, um, and he models one of his works on a work by Panaetius. And Cicero thinks that Stoicism is, is, will provide a very useful philosophical training for Romans, for Roman culture. That there's a lot here that the Romans can use. And so when we think about Rome at this point, and it's, it's, it's kind of cultural and military splendour, we need to keep in mind here the influence of Greece, the influence of Greek philosophy. That much of the Roman aristocracy are being trained in Greek philosophy, and they're being trained in Greek. They read philosophy in Greek, and they will often write philosophy in Greek as well. So it's this kind of moment, really, where we should begin to start thinking about where Seneca is coming from. So we've heard about Seneca's death. What about his life? Well, Seneca is born in Spain, what is now Spain. He's born in Cordoba, um, which is then the, the Roman province of Hispania. So he's not a Roman by birth, but he's a Roman by culture, because Rome, the Roman Empire... Um, Roman Empire, it kind of exists as a kind of multi, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multinational empire in this period. Now, even though Seneca has a very prominent public life, you know, given the fact that he is a tutor and then advisor to Nero, and in a way kind of governs the state under Nero for a few years, it's surprising that not that much is known about his early life. We don't actually know when exactly he was born. Uh, dates vary from 4 BC to 1 AD, 1 CE, but we do know a bit about his background. So he's from, I guess we could call the upper middle class, he's from the, the, the knight class, the equestrian class. They're not the senatorial class, they're not the top, but they're, you know, they're nearly there. Now, his, now Seneca, Lucius Annaeus Seneca, is known as Seneca the Younger. His father, Seneca the Elder, uh, was um, a prominent figure in Roman culture, and he was a, a teacher of rhetoric. He was socially ambitious. And so even though Seneca and his brothers are born in Spain, um, from a young age, um, they're taken to Rome. He's taken to Rome at the age of five. Now, while he's in Rome, he learns what a good, you know, aspiring member of the Roman governing class learns, which is rhetoric and philosophy. So again, a lot of Greek culture kind of comes in this way. And we hear that Seneca was taught um, in particular under the, by the philosopher Attalus the Stoic. So it's interesting, this is something that we have thought about and debated in the past, about what, what Stoicism means as a, as a political philosophy. And one thing that we want to kind of keep in mind here is why was Stoicism so amenable and so useful to the Roman governing class? I mean, there is a lot of emphasis on duty, but there isn't really... You know, much emphasis on uh, radical redistribution. There is a kind of cosmic egalitarianism, but it doesn't play out into um, a political egalitarianism. Now, if you think about just the facts of Seneca's life in a nutshell, well, we have these things about his upbringing. Throughout his life, he's a very popular writer. He writes in Latin, not Greek. He's a popular public speaker. His works are very widely read. He's a kind of he's a celebrity writer. And then he becomes 
a celebrity political figure. And this, while he does um, become an important public speaker under the Emperor Caligula, it's really under Nero that um, he, you know, he really kind of comes to the fore and he becomes very wealthy, actually. And he governs, makes lots of important decisions, and then he's forced to take his own life after this. Now let's just think a bit about these emperors, because Seneca survives quite a few of them. And what's interesting is that he has a, a number of death sentences. Um, I'm trying to think, he has three death sentences. He, the third one kills him. I mean, that's not bad going to survive two before them. Now, Seneca, um, Seneca, uh, Seneca's life is under the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire hasn't been an empire for that long. And then the previous kind of century, um, there, are, there have been great struggles. And it proved to have been a republic inspired by, by republican ideas. And it's really through the kind of struggles of very powerful military generals. We might think of Julius Caesar, who, doesn't, who isn't an emperor because he's assassinated, but he nearly he wants to become an emperor. And then the first emperor, Emperor Augustus. So this structure of Roman politics has completely changed. It's gone from a republic with a senate, you know, really in charge, to having, having an emperor and entering a form of monarchy, for better or for worse. And maybe from my perspective, I think it's quite amazing that, that Rome lasted as long as it did as a form of violent monarchy. You know, this form of political power isn't well suited to long-lasting stable government whatsoever. And one of the things that appears quite quickly under the Roman Empire are um, <laughs> um, very unfit rulers. And one of them is under Seneca's life, the Emperor Caligula, who you see before you, a young man. Now, we don't know, it's hard to tell um, what was wrong with Caligula. Maybe he had epilepsy, maybe he, um, he had serious mental illness or he suffered some form of um, acquired brain injury through his epilepsy but he has periods he begins as a ruler you know being somewhat sensible and then after a period of serious illness he becomes very paranoid and makes lots of very bad decisions and, and is known for being a very kind of violent and just quite a weird ruler basically he tries to apparently make his horse into a god now how does this bear on Seneca well Seneca as a young man um Begins, um, first becomes prominent as a public speaker under the rule of Caligula. And Caligula orders Seneca to be um, assassinated as a result. He must have said something that offended um, Caligula in some way. And so this is in the year 31, so maybe Seneca is about 25, in his late 20s. Um, he upsets Caligula, and so Caligula sentences him to death. Um, but uh, then, because Seneca is in poor health, the death sentence is cancelled. Now let's just say something quite quite quickly early on. Something that we should keep in mind when we're thinking about Seneca's philosophy. Which is that he's a man who suffers poor health throughout his life. Asthma, possibly tuberculosis, different chronic health conditions. So just as in his uh, his early his kind of early years, he's studying rhetoric and philosophy. He's very interested in philosophy. He enters public life, and then he's given this death sentence. What happens next is that um, Seneca then goes to Egypt, where he lives with his aunt, um, and he's in a kind of exile then. And we, can, we don't quite know what he's doing in Egypt during this time after death sentence number one on the Caligula, but we might assume that he is still continuing his studies of philosophy. He's still writing in some form. Anyway, he uh, ends up being recalled to Rome. And Caligula is assassinated, that's often a thing that commonly happens to Roman emperors, um, and there is a new uh, emperor, and this is Claudius. Uh, Claudius ends up, um, well, quite quickly under Claudius's rule, um, Seneca is sentenced to a second death sentence, this time because he's rumoured to have had an affair with Caligula's sister. The death sentence is cancelled, this time he's sent into exile in Corsica, and Corsica is where we met him earlier looking out on the rock while he's in Corsica he produces three consolations um, one to Helvia his mother another to Marcia and another to Polybius and we'll talk about them more in a second and he starts working a bit on natural science so it's these exile periods of exile that he's doing his, his study you know his philosophical withdrawal but Claudius's new wife brings him back to Rome 
and he is now a tutor to the young Nero. And this is Nero on the left, and somebody's trying to work out what he might look like on the right. Now, the time on the Nero is interesting. Uh, some of you might have seen, know I, Claudius by Robert Graves turned into a BBC drama in the 70s. At first, Nero's rule is not too bad, actually. Um, and this is largely what it's for, because um, as a young man, he'd been advised by Seneca, and then, um, well, he'd been tutored by Seneca, and then Seneca and another guy, Boris, are kind of running the Nero state um, between the years 54 and 62. And this is an image from the early 20th century of Seneca on the right trying to um, persuade Nero on the left. Now, you probably, when we think of Nero, again, we think of another, you know, kind of, you know, morally unfit ruler, one who fiddles while, while Rome burns. And so Seneca, this is what makes Seneca such an interesting figure, that he has these periods of withdrawal and then he's in the centre of political life. A lot of his philosophy is about, um, about being frugal, it's about, you know, fortune, it's about withdrawal, and yet he's right at the centre. He seems to be sceptical about wealth, and yet he becomes very wealthy on the Nero. So despite this stoic training, he ends up being at the centre of the Roman Empire, and it's when Burrus, this other guy, uh, dies in 62, um, that Seneca kind of realises that his, you know, he, his influence over Nero is also declining. And from 62, he, this is when he goes into um, withdrawal, into like early retirement basically and he wants to officially retire but Nero won't let him and then he ends up being implicated in this conspiracy so this is Seneca's life now I mentioned at the beginning about whether there are two Senecas <laughs> and this is something I want you to explore here because we've got Seneca the figure who emphasizes virtue and then we have a figure who by necessity and by events is forced into kind of you know viceful directions and ends and this comes up in different ways um, there's a really good article about um, Seneca in the New Yorker by Elizabeth Colbert and she describes Seneca there as being like the Roman fixer the Roman go-to man even in I Claudius Seneca is not you know he's not a good figure at all he's this kind of sycophant you know he's not to be trusted so it's interesting that we read you know, some of the most kind of striking and sterling of human wisdom from him. Now, when Nero um, is appointed um, emperor, again, I think this is after um, Claudius's untimely death, um, what Nero does next is he cooks up um, a conspiracy um, to implicate his, his mother, um, I think it's his mother, um, into, into a terrorist plot. And so, in order to, so Nero quite quickly tries to um, get rid of his political rivals and enemies in different ways. And so, there's this story where he um, basically tries to um, kill his mother um, by um, having her sail off in a, in, a, in a boat, which has been given to her as a gift, but the boat is a, a death trap. It's literally a death trap. It's been designed to kind of crash and, and fall apart, and, you know, so that it looks like she dies as an accident. But it doesn't work for lots of ways, and the story is quite funny, it's quite dark, really funny, quite dramatic. Um, and then, because she survives, Nero then has to kind of invent um, a, a, a story, invent a story that um, there is um, a terrorist plot to kill him. And so Nero um, ends up um, killing her, executing her, and he uses Seneca to give the justification for this. So Seneca basically is invited and has to provide the ideological justification of quite a cruel um, murder, a kind of a, a fake news terrorist conspiracy. And this kind of line comes, comes from this, this is from Nero gives a speech and he says that I'm safe, neither as yet do I believe, nor do I rejoice. Now Nero was safe, but the fact is that he uses, he uses Seneca, maybe Seneca allows himself to be used, or Seneca is willing to help, or... Seneca, maybe that's because of the Dominic Cummings type figure, is leading the direction in this idea that Nero is under danger and that Nero therefore has the right to assassinate his opponents, his enemies. How can Seneca allow that to happen? 
Is Seneca a bad Stoic? I'm going to explore this claim more. Now, there are lots of points in Seneca's philosophy where he is looking down, you know, on material wealth. He doesn't need it. Why would, it, you know, a true Stoic doesn't need that? Seneca says in one of his letters, My eyes shall no more be overwhelmed by the glitter of gold than by the glitter of a sword. I shall spurn with magnificent strength of purpose the things all other men pray for and the things all other men are afraid of. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? You know, this is somebody who's not going to be corrupted by Rome. But as we're going to see in a moment, Seneca was actually really wealthy and lived a life of great luxury and owned an awful lot of property. Now, when he's in Corsica and he's writing to his mother and others, he describes Corsica as being this barren rock where no one lives. But actually, Corsica isn't like that. Corsica is a, a centre of Roman culture. There were a lot of Roman intellectuals there. He kind of makes up that, you know, he's having a hard time of it. When he writes to Polybius, another figure, um, about, you know, Polybius has lost um, one of his close ones. What Seneca does in this letter is he makes a number of appeals to uh, Claudius's mercy. When he's writing these consolations to various people, then we could look at them as, you know, wonderful works of human spirit and human genius. But we could also look at them as works that are designed to be seen, heard by the Roman public, designed to get him a reprieve so they can come back to Rome. But he's using you know, this is his training in rhetoric, his father's subject, in order to um, achieve concrete political ends. So, we need to be a little bit wary, is all I'm saying. There's more to this guy than meets the eye. Now, one thing that we want to keep in mind here, and this is something that has appeared in our previous discussions, is Stoicism as a political philosophy and where it goes and what it teaches. Now, this has been slightly before Seneca's time, but the Spartacus and the slave uprising. Rome, the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, are powered by slave labour. So how is it that, what, what can Stoic philosophy meaningfully say, uh, well, how can it be meaningful if it, if it preaches the fact that all human beings are by nature equal and that we need to live according to nature and that we might remember from last week, Zeno, we need to be indifferent to wealth. Okay, great. But then how does that, how can you teach this stuff? How can it be so popular with the, the Roman upper class when there is such vast inequality everywhere? Surely such a, a cosmic egalitarianism would lead to the abolition of slavery and, and such things. Now this is a hard one because we're placing modern thoughts into our ancients. They couldn't see, they couldn't think that, sl that abolishing slavery was feasible or viable. For them it was not imaginable. But still we need to kind of keep in mind this image of Seneca, the wealthy man. Seneca, this guy, one of his nicknames, by the Roman poet Marshall was super rich Seneca. Now part of this story of super rich Seneca comes to the fore um, during his kind of his rise to power and success and Seneca is accused by one of his enemies this is during the time of Nero when Seneca really has kind of risen to the top he's accused by one of his enemies Publius um, Sullius of actually being a, a hypocrite. So, Sulius um, says, By what kind of wisdom or maxims of philosophy had Seneca, within four years of royal favour, amassed 300 million sesterces? Now, what are sesterces? Well, two, a single sestertius gets you two loaves of bread. Most Romans in this period have a subsistence life. Now, the Roman upper class, the Roman senators, they might have maybe 5 million sesterces. Seneca said to have 300 million. He is in the top 0.1% of the, the population in terms of wealth during the time of Nero. So how can this figure, who's all about frugality and being indifferent to fortune, how do we square that with this vast wealth? Now another tricky part of the Seneca as hypocrite story um, relates to Britain. So 
Britain had been um, only recently conquered by the, by the Romans. Julius Caesar invades and conquers a bit, but then it goes back. Um, and then later, uh, the Emperor Claudius um, conducts another invasion. And this time, the, the Romans get a kind of permanent stranglehold over Britain. Now, not long after um, this time, um, Seneca apparently um, loans 40 million sesterces to the British, to the, the new British governing class. But these are probably going to be in, like local chieftains who have decided to kind of side with the Romans and become clients of the Romans. So Seneca apparently lends them 40 million, but then he charges a steep rate of interest, which they cannot repay. And this apparently is what causes um, Boudicca's uprising. You might know the story of Boudicca, a Iceni warrior queen. Um, who rises up against the Romans and destroys various cities and kills a lot of people. Did Seneca cause this because of his money grubbing, because of his, you know, his desire to make profit through interest? Well, this is, I mean, it's, this is compelling stuff, isn't it? But we have to be a little bit wary, at least when it comes to the story of Sulius. Sulius was an opponent of Seneca and he had been an informant of Claudius, and he was under attack. And so what Sulius' side of events passes down to us, but we don't have any other eyewitness accounts of what Seneca's life was like otherwise. So basically we're hearing something from one of his enemies. Maybe he wasn't as wealthy as this. The story of the British is unclear. Tacitus, we had him earlier, the image of his life. Tacitus isn't really a fan of Seneca either. Again, it's that association with Nero, which is a big problem. Nonetheless, Seneca was very wealthy. He has a lot of villas around Italy, he has lots of land in Egypt and other places. Um, and one, another account tells us that um, he apparently owned 500 citrus wood tables with ivory legs. So he owned, why would somebody own 500 very fancy tables? And this is because apparently he liked to have banquets and you know wine and dine all his friends. Oh, so what do we do with this? Where do we fit it? How do we fit this testimony, what some fits from enemies, with the image of Seneca that we have? Well, bear in mind that the Stoics are not like the Cynics in that they say that we should be indifferent to wealth, but in the words of Zeno, there are some indifference that are to be preferred. <laughs> okay, some are not too bad. Now, Seneca tells us, quote, The wise man would not despise himself even if he were a midget, but he would rather be tall. He's got no problem, isn't it? You know, he can, you know, the Stoic philosophy should be about teaching us to live with very little. But you know what? If, if someone's offering you a few, offering a few million sesterces, a few top public positions, a few bits of land, a nice villa in Tuscany or wherever, you're not going to, you know, why would you refuse? Seneca tells us that we should try and enjoy wealth, but we shouldn't need it. We shouldn't be dependent on it. Elsewhere, he says, he is a great man who uses clay dishes as if they were silver, but he is equally great who uses silver as if it were clay. So there's nothing wrong with being filthy rich. You've just got to not need it. Okay, maybe there is something very aristocratic in that outlook. He does say that we should try and acquire wealth without bloodshed, you know. Um, but there's this lasting question over his legacy, and, and this comes up in a couple of the things that I've put up on Moodle for you to read. Uh, an interesting perspective comes from Emily Wilson, who writes this recent biography of Seneca, um, and she says that basically what makes Seneca interesting is that he is that he still is a Stoic despite having all this wealth. So we shouldn't be so critical of him for being a hypocrite. What's interesting is that he still is a Stoic anyway. And in another piece, Emily Wilson also says, well, nowadays all of us it might be kind of hypocrites, you know, more middle class people in the West. You know, we might believe that we, you know, we should live without gadgets and we should live. A mindful existence and yet we still buy lots of tap that we don't need and um, we still have lots of you know fancy stuff on our houses you know what do we need it well we, we, we act like we talk we, we we talk the talk but we don't often walk the walk emily wilson quote the most interesting thing is not why seneca failed to practice what he preached but why he preached what he did so adamantly and so effectively given the life he found himself leaving leading so there's the two Senecas, keep this in mind. Now, something else that we need to keep in mind with Seneca before we start drilling into his philosophy is what else Seneca did in his life. So he is known for writing letters, he's known for writing short essays, but he also wrote, produced a lot of tragedies. 
Now these tragedies um, end up becoming very popular in the Renaissance. They inspire a lot of early modern English drama, in particular Shakespeare. Thomas Kidd is another. Um, now Seneca's tragedies basically take Greek stories like Medea and so on, and they usually make them much more violent, much more visceral. Um, the emotions are much more heightened. It's, not, it's sometimes wondered, it's usually posed that basically these tragedies couldn't have been performed in public, you know, at least in terms of the actors acting on the parts, because they were so violent and so gory, that they had to be read aloud and something. We'll come back to the tragedies a bit later on, but it's just interesting to think about somebody who is a Stoic, and the traditional image of the Stoic is somebody who is above the passions, and yet Seneca produces work that's all about the passions, and not just all about the passions, these works are about amplified, heightened passions emotions. Now the work that we're going to focus on later is on the shortness of life, but Seneca is more known actually for a work that's sometimes called Letters from a Stoic or Letters to Lucilius. We're going to look at these in detail a bit later, but let's just kind of keep, well these letters themselves are, they're a form of um, literature that takes the form of letters. But we shouldn't think of them as a series of individual letters um, that Seneca wrote in you know, good faith just for his correspondent. He uses the letter form as a way to kind of speak to us and address us. And that's what makes his writing really interesting. That he deals in these everyday topics. And here's some of the key works. I mean, he produces other stuff as well. These consolations that he writes while in exile in Corsica at the top. He writes on anger. We'll talk about this more later, on the shortness of life. He writes one satire about Claudia shortly after he dies, um, where Claudius has turned into a pumpkin, just kind of taking the piss out of him. He writes on clemency, on mercy, it's sometimes translated. Uh, this is to Nero, and it's basically telling Nero to um, stop us, you know, so kind of violently assassinating his political enemies and trying to set out an idea, a model for the virtuous, virtuous emperor. On the happy life, on benefits. Okay, what you're noticing with later works is that there's concentration in the late 60s, or the mid early 60s, sorry. Um, but it, this cluster of works um, are when he is kind of, he's withdrawn, he's fallen from favour with Nero, he's writing from his estates, and he's writing benefits. On natural questions is a work of physics, important for Stoics, and the letters to Lucilius at the very end of his life. That's why the letters to Lucilius are important and interesting, because this is at the very end, whereas what we're going to talk about, the shortness of life, is kind of in his middle career. So maybe there's more for development later. Okay, so that's Seneca. Right, let's fit Seneca in to the overall context. So the late Stoa, the late Stoa, who are we dealing with? Let's look at this image from last week. Now here are our timeline of Stoics, uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. And we have been looking, well, we've so far looked at the guys on the left. Um, Diogenes of Babylon to Posidonius are, we could say, our middle stoa. Diogenes, part of the Athenian delegation, um, Panaitis of Posidonius, um, are figures that are bringing, they're Greeks, but they're bringing the Greek culture and Greek philosophy into the Roman world. Now look, look, there's a gap, Posidonius to Seneca. Now we're going to try and fill in a little bit of that gap. Um, we could almost put Cicero in that gap, actually. Um, but Cicero isn't a Stoic. That's the big problem. <laughs> it popularises Stoic philosophy. Now, what's interesting is that there are some Stoics in the middle, but they're not really writing anything. It's not that their writing has been destroyed. It's just that they, their lives are Stoic lives, but they don't really write much. Anyway, let's get back into what these Stoics as a school are trying to do. Now, on the left is Panaetius. And on the right is Posidonius. Now, what were our Stoics as a school trying to do? Let's try and remember from last week. Now, you will recall that for the Stoics, there are three things that philosophy should focus on, three topoi. And they had various analogies. There was the one about the egg, the one about the field, the one about an animal's body. Logic, physics and ethics. What's interesting is that when we think about um, Stoic philosophy, we mainly just think about the ethics nowadays, about these the psychological advice, you know, in times of trouble. And that's more the ethical side of things. But what's really important for the Stoics in this period is to understand, in order to kind of develop these arguments, you need to understand nature. We'll remember from last week the big emphasis on living in agreement with nature, 
We get that from Zeno, living in agreement, living consistently. Cleantes, Chrysippus, living in agreement with nature. Now, Posidonius on the right, um, who ends up moving to Rhodes, um, was known in his time as a polymath. He um, doesn't, you know, this isn't just focusing on ethics. He produces a lot of work on the natural sciences and on history. Um, now, we'll remember that um, Greece goes into a kind of decline, and so he, Posidonius, is in Rhodes. And um, this philosophical culture is, is kind of temporarily moving to the periphery. Now, our middle Stoics are producing a lot of writing, but the writing doesn't survive. And um, when Cicero writes on duties, he's got Panaitis' on duties in front of him as he writes. Um, but we don't know what Panaitis had to say. It's lost. Anyway, Posidonius um, on Rhodes, he ends up becoming a friend of important people. Like he's a friend of Cicero, he's a friend of Pompey. Now, I mentioned earlier about how Roman, the Roman, the junior Roman government, governing class and being educated in Stoic philosophy. And that's an interesting fact. Why is that? Why does it appeal to them? Self-control, ascesis, training perhaps, attention to what is appropriate, attention to virtue and virtuous rule. I guess we could all say these, there's lots of obvious things here. Now important figures in the end of the Roman Republic were actual, well, were apparently actual Stoics. You know, they, they preached Stoic philosophy, at least in their public speeches in the, in the Senate. Cato the Younger is one. Brutus, et tu, Brutus, is another. Both, according to history, were Stoics. And then later on, the first proper Roman emperor, the Emperor Augustus, uh, I think his name is Gaius Octavian, uh, his tutor is a Stoic. I actually looked at this last week briefly, but even in the Greek world, a lot of Stoics end up being tutors to you know, Greek leaders in different ways. So there are these connections here. We have a kind of... Roman governing class being trained in this work. Now, one thing that has been ho hovering over us, which is, which you should be asking all the time, in the history of philosophy, how many Stoics, which are where are the women? Where are the damn women? Now, there are no women in Plato or Aristotle's schools. They're forbidden, they're not allowed. Women were allowed into Epicurus's school. Now, what about the Greek Stoic school? On that, I'm not too sure. I think they probably were forbidden as well. Because um, we don't hear of any um, female Stoic philosophers or students, as far as I'm aware, uh, in the Greek school. But they do become more prominent in Roman Stoicism. Now, you might have noticed that I was just, I was kind of a bit hesitant there, wasn't I? I didn't say a Roman Stoic school. Because there isn't really, what, when we want to think about late, the late Stoa and Roman Stoicism, we shouldn't be thinking of it as a, as a kind of school led by a principal or led by a head teacher. What happens in this period is that you have Stoic ideas being taught to many, to many Roman, Romans of the governing class. And so the Roman Stoics are more people in public life who kind of live in a Stoic way. That might be the best way of thinking about it. Nonetheless, let's think about Stoic attitudes to women. Now, this guy in front of you is Musonius, Musonius Rufus. He is a Roman knight, a Roman equestrian, the same class as Seneca. Now, not that much writing by him survives. He wrote in Greek, because Greek was the language of philosophy back then. What's interesting about Seneca is that he writes in Latin. Um, but Musonius Rufus, the writing that does survive, is very insistent that women should be taught philosophy and that um, women should not be excluded from philosophy. Some of the arguments that he makes um, a reminiscent of Mary Wollstonecraft's arguments much later on. In particular, the idea of shared rationality. So, Musonius Rufus says that, quote, women have received from the gods the same rationality as men have. Now, those of you that know Mary Wollstonecraft, she makes a lot of similar arguments in uh, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Um, she appeals to God, and she appeals to this rationality which has come from, been given by God the Creator. An interesting, interesting one, isn't it? He continues, quote, Further, the desire for and affinity to virtue are not limited to men, but also occur in women. For they, no less than men, are naturally pleased by honourable and just actions and censure their opposites. Since all of this... Is the case why would it be appropriate for men to inquire and investigate how to live honorably 
this is what practicing philosophy is, but not for women. Is it appropriate for men to be good, but not women? Now, many of you think it is completely stating the obvious in some ways. But there is something radical here because this material, part of the reason why it survives and not much else survived by Musonius Rufus is that it's seen as kind of a novelty perspective. Oh, Musonius Rufus, he's the guy that said it's okay for women to learn philosophy. Ah, let's reproduce that in our anthologies of curious ancient thought. This is partly how it passes down to us. Musonius Rufus also says that you can be a philosopher and be married. You know, you, you know, you can be a philosopher and own property. You can have a normal life and, and do philosophy. You don't need to become a kind of monk. Here, in that example, he gives, the, uh, he gives Socrates as an example. Crates, the cynic, is another. What we also get from this period, but it's hard to say for sure if they're really philosophers, is the phenomenon of stoic women philosophers. Let's just look at this briefly. Um, this will help us come back to Roman public culture a bit later on. So uh, history tells us about three women in particular who are described in different ways as philosophers or as Stoics, but they don't produce any writing. We don't believe they actually wrote anything. Again, keep this in mind, Roman Stoics, it's the way they live, it's not what they write, that's what counts. I'll show you one. Now we can see a, um, what's like a, a very wealthy looking woman, and she's doing something to her leg. You can see blood on her leg. She's cut her leg. She's cut her leg with quite a small blade. Why? Why is that? So this is Portia Catonis. Portia Catonis. Now she is the daughter of Cato the Younger and the wife of Brutus. We heard about them just earlier. Now both of both these figures are in different ways were at the centre of the failed effort to stop Rome from becoming an empire. It is a republic at first, and it champions republican ideas, and of governing in the interest of the people and so forth, not in the interest of the emperor, like a monarchy. Um, Brutus assassinates Julius Caesar. Uh, Cato the Younger is um, kind of forced to take his own life after being kind of um, harassed um, out of the Roman Republic. Um, now, Portia is the wife of Brutus, and the story goes here. This is she. She her story is given as an ex as an example of the constancy of a good wife, and of the virtue and self control, um, and the way that her mind kind of goes above her body and what she does in this particular example, which is that she cuts her own leg. Actually, in a way that's as so the story goes, it would have been much more you know like near death than this, um, because she wants to persuade Brutus. That she can be trusted because she sees that Brutus looks very preoccupied and worried and she wants him to disclose his thoughts so that she could be a good wife and help him in this time of great desperation which is part of the plot to assassinate his friend Julius Caesar so she cuts her own leg in this really like gory way in order to kind of show that you know she, he must take her seriously Plutarch describes Portia as being addicted to philosophy so she's somebody who's studying and discussing and learning philosophy. Addiction is an interesting way of putting it. Spends all her time studying philosophy. Um, later on, the, so the story goes, she takes her own life by swallowing hot coals, which sounds like a terrible way to die. Um, she appears in Shakespeare later, and Julius Caesar offers his character Portia uh, with a T, but her name is with a C, Portia Catonis. Okay. Um, Two offers, and then let's talk about something that you've probably already spotted. Uh, Fania uh, is the daughter of Frassia, who is the leader of the opposition to Nero. And she's the wife of Helvidius. Now, Frassia and Helvidius are both these men are forced to take their own life um, because they oppose the emperor. Now, Frassia is, is often described as being the leader of the Stoic opposition. So this gives us the sense that... There are a bunch of, of Stoic-inspired politicians, philosophers, who oppose what Nero is doing. And they oppose what Nero is doing, not just because he's a kind of a cruel and unfit ruler, but because they have Republican sympathies. They want to go back to the Republic. So Fanny is also described as being quite philosophical, um, and she is basically forced to take her own life, which she you know, faces with um, kind of tranquility as well. 
And then a third um, is Anya Cornethicia Faustina. Again, it's more like a stoic life and stoic writing and her claim to fame that she's related to a man. Okay, Again, now you're, now you're noticing it. She's the daughter of Marcus Aurelius and she's executed by Caracalla, who's another cruel, bonkers, tyrant. You know, he, this is another common thing that we see with empire. Um, and she, again, she faces her death with complete uh, even-mindedness and here she is you know she's described as you know being pri privately uh, withdrawn and studying philosophy not being taken up with not being distressed by death basically so too with Cato the younger who takes his own life with the fall of as the Roman Republic is falling and Brutus as well here is a dramatic image of Julius Caesar being assassinated. So what we what we're dealing with here, these middle Stoa are prominent people in the governing class who are living in a Stoic way. And the things that posterity is remembering for the Stoic women is this tranquility before death, this adherence to duty, this attention to virtue, virtue being a quality of the mind, the mind's understanding of surrounding events. Now let's look at some teachings from the, uh, let's call it the middle Stoa. One from Cicero that we looked at last week, where Cicero is talking about how the Stoic mentality, Stoic philosophy leads to um, an adherence to the common good. Cicero. From which it naturally follows that we put the common advantage ahead of our own. For just as the laws put the well-being of all ahead of the well-being of individuals, so too the good and wise man. Who is obedient to the laws and not unaware of his civic duty looks out for the advantage of all more than for that of any one person or his own now cato the younger um one of the defenders of the republic we get there's a lot of kind of interesting stuff attributed to him he's he becomes seen in the enlightenment period as a, as a hero of political liberty against absolute monarchy cato apparently says Whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing freedom of speech. Without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. Elsewhere, he says, in doing nothing, men learn to do evil. So it's a bit incomplete, isn't it? But what we're sketching out here is the middle, the middle stoa into the late stoa. Um, and this is the world in which Seneca emerges, immense power struggles, a Greek culture of stoicism around virtue, self-control, control of the passions, wisdom and civic duty. A culture that emphasises a training of philosophy and rhetoric. But also a world, and we've seen this with the rise of the emperors, where ambition is very much encouraged and in where if you don't fight, you're squashed. Intrigues are everywhere. Conspiracies are everywhere. Which side are you on? So let's think about this in terms of Seneca's world and how Seneca fits into all this as a Stoic. So in this section, we're just going to think about Seneca's broader qualities as a thinker. And then in the next section, we're going to look at on the brevity of life, on the shortness of life. So Seneca, what characterizes him? As a writer, at least. Well, we've already um, talked earlier about how he's very prominent in Roman life. Well, as a statesman on the Nero, but before then, under Caligula and then Claudius, as a public speaker. And as a writer, these consolations that he writes to Helvia, Marcia and Polybius are published and they're widely available to Romans. They're read and discussed. Um, one thing that you will have noticed with the reading for this week um, is that he, he gives very everyday examples. These are examples that would have been known to Romans. You know, they're about public life, about being a lawyer, about Roman generals and Roman politicians. He writes in Latin and not Greek. So why does that matter? Um, well, Greek is the language of philosophy and Greek is um, what Musonius Rufus is going to write in. Um, very few people are writing philosophy in Latin in this period. Now, the first really is Cicero. And what Cicero tries to do is he makes a big effort to translate Greek philosophical terms into Latin, and he does it in different ways. We saw this last week briefly 
with impulse. Impulse is all natural things have an affinity for their own constitution. They're driven by an impulse to preserve their constitution. The Greek word is horme, and Cicero translates it into conatus. Conatus, very important to Spinoza much later on. Um, so Cicero has tried to translate stuff into Latin. Uh, enough of prominent person writing in Latin is Lucretius, an Epicurean who writes on the nature of things. He basically translates uh, Epicurus's philosophy into, Rome, into a, a wonderful Latin poem. So this is happening around this time, and then you've got Seneca. But Seneca's works are very popular, very widely read. Whereas Cicero's style is often quite flowery, Seneca's prose is, is kind of, um, the sentences are short, it's quite dense and sinewy. It's meant to be straight to the point. It's kind of, it tries to be muscular and frugal in its writing. There isn't too much flowery literary description. It's dealing in truths. It's unadorned. That is how his Latin kind of goes, how it flows. And of course, he, he can become so much more accept, accessible to Roman culture if he's writing in Latin, because not everyone is going to be learning Greek. Um, so he uses these everyday examples. And the common feature in all of the works is an emphasis on the mind's control of itself over fortune, over unstable events, developing or training the mind's control, the mind's self-control. And this training in an, it becomes an indifference to fortune. Even an embrace of adversity. Let's look at some quotes. So writing to Helvia, his mother, he says, Two most excellent things will accompany us, namely a common nature and our own special virtue. Now, a common nature, this is nature that's common to all human beings. It is excellent. And we're going to see this actually later quite subtly in, on the shortness of life. This affirmation of nature. Nature is not a bad thing. Nature hasn't screwed us over. Nature is to be loved and wondered at. Now, nature is what we have in common with others, but the one thing that we have common to us, ourselves, is our own minds. How we train our minds to, be, to have virtue, to have virtue in Greek, arete, skill, to be skilled in understanding nature, skilled in understanding ourselves. With that, Seneca also encourages a kind of indifference to the, um, the, the, the comings and goings of the day. Enough of quote. The seven wonders of the world and any even greater wonders which the ambition of later ages has constructed will be seen someday levelled with the ground. So it is. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. Great emperors rise and fall. Within that then is the stoic sage, indifferent to fortune, trying to focus on developing his own mind. This is Seneca as a good stoic philosopher. Let's keep that versus Seneca in public life. Maybe Seneca the bad stoic. In one place, Seneca says that, you know, like we, fortune is going to be it, too much good fortune, too much pleasure is a bad thing. It's going to make us lazy. If we have an easy life, a pampered life, then we, we haven't encountered anything that's going to make us strong, grow as individuals. We're going to be lazy. We're going to be soft. We need adversity. Adversity makes us strong. Adversity trains us. We should embrace adversity. And he gives this analogy, and John Sellers talks about this, um, of wrestling. That if a wrestler wants to carry on being a really good wrestler and really physically strong and able, then he needs good opponents. He can't just be wrestling, you know, little kids and stuff. <laughs> you know, he, we need terrible things to happen to us from time to time to keep our minds focused on what matters and to keep our minds focused on the, on the right use of time and the right use of our mind's attention. If we don't have these things, then we're going to be easily distracted by the pursuit of wealth or honour or sensual pleasures. We need to be on guard. Now, I mentioned before the letters to Lucilius, and these are interesting. So I guess it's worth just knowing briefly about these, because um, you might find if you enjoy reading Seneca, this will probably be the next place to turn to. Um, so there, this is a fairly substantial work. Um, he writes, that, well, what survives are 124 letters in 20 books, but it, might, it seems like there might have been actually more than this. And Lucilius is um, a younger man of the same class. He's a kind of a Stoic. He wants to become a Stoic, basically. And what these letters are trying to do is, is train Lucilius into becoming a Stoic. 
and they start off being quite simple, you know, giving these simple lessons. It seems like Lucilius just wants uh, the greatest hits of Stoic philosophy. He wants, you know, we might mention week one, the way that Stoicism has been popularised in our own times in terms of career hacks or life hacks and all this bullshit. Um, Lucilius seems to be wanting something like this. He wants uh, Seneca to give him little maxims, you know, little phrases and statements that he can remember by heart. And Seneca's kind of doing this at the beginning, but as he goes on, he says, look, I can't be giving you this stuff. It's not really encouraging you to think. You need to think more deeply. And so what, how the letters to Lucilius work is that they're a learning guide where Seneca's trying to give him examples from everyday life, um, certain test cases. He talks about his own life as well, because he wants to encourage Lucilius to have to self-scrutinize, to interrogate himself, to admonish himself. He wants to give Lucilius the, the skills, basically, to be a good Stoic. And they get more complex and more dense as the letters go on, because basically Lucilius. So it goes, learns more and more. Now, these letters are interesting because they appear at the end of Seneca's life. Well, he didn't know it was, it was going to be the end of his life, but it's in his final two for years. Seneca is in old age for this time. He's in his, it seems to be in his late 50s or early 60s. His health is poor, um, his co political career is finished, um, he's in a kind of withdrawal. So he's producing that work then, basically. Um, there's some interesting themes, he talks about old age, mortality, he comes back to some of the stuff that we'll look at, the shortness of life, making the most of life. He talks about his own health, having asthma, and he talks about the health of the body mirroring the health of the mind. Now I guess that's interesting in terms of what we know about the Stoic outlook that everything is material, the materialism of the Stoic. That what individuates you or I is, is our bodies, our bodies in space. And our knowledge is something that exists within our bodies, our minds, our, 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 something that are made up of bodily sensation, bodily sense impressions that we then reflect on. While he's also an exile, he produces natural questions, which is like a vast, wide-ranging work of physics. So let's keep this in mind, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius later on, they don't, they're not interested in logic or, or physics, they're too off the top way in any way whatsoever. But Seneca is, and he produces this work, you know, writing and exploring the sciences of the day. So he still has that interest. It just isn't as prominent in his life. Now, Seneca has some interesting things to say on the passions. One of his interesting works is on anger. Um, and um, basically on anger, um, Seneca says that Seneca says that anger is also a bad thing. Now, anger, in a certain sense, sense is inevitable. You know, we're going to be struck by a bodily reaction to something that happens to us where someone that we value is harmed or, or we lose it. But the big problem for Seneca is, is when we act on that reaction. That's when we're harmed. So Seneca, anger always harms us. It always damages us. And he describes these three stages of anger. They're interesting to think about, this is how we think about anger nowadays. So stage one is the um, involuntary reaction, the uh, physiological reaction to, to, to kind of seeing or encountering something that we value being harmed. And now this physiological reaction, you know, like seeing red, ah, clenching our teeth, this is kind of out of our control. It happens to us. But here's where the stoic stuff comes in. Stage two, this is what we can control, and this is our judgment in response to that experience. Now, it's our judgment, it's, this is our judgment of us deciding on whether we want payback, whether we want retribution for what's happened. Now, what Seneca's Stoic philosophy is determined to teach is that we need to see external things around us as, as neither good nor bad. We need to be indifferent to fortune. We need to accept that we're going to lose a lot of things that we value. And so when something is harmed that we value, we need to make a judgment that it is not worth acting on that anger because terrible consequences will follow. Because the third stage, if we do act on the anger, um, is an emotion that is out of our control. It's the rage, is the lashing out. This is great damage is done in this, as we all know. You know, so it's not about not feeling anything, but it's about what Seneca is trying to teach us is to not act on on the impulse. That's where the training comes in. That's where ascesis, exercise, wrestling comes in. Something else that we see in some of the other works is this indifference to fortune. And Seneca says in a few different places that nothing bad ever really happens. So what does that mean? 
Well, let's keep in mind Socrates. Socrates is such an important teacher for the Stoics that a good man cannot be halved. Seneca says something like this in On the Shortness of Life. Now, for the Stoics, um, external events um, or things like health and wealth are indifferent. They're neither good nor bad in themselves. And Seneca makes this point in On Providence. Because they can be used for good or bad ends. They can be used, but in themselves, they might not necessarily deliver us contentment. And what Seneca encourages us to do, and this is especially a feature of his outlook and his work, is this continuous um, meditation and attention to ourselves and, in, and an interrogation of how we respond to events. We need to remind ourselves of what is important. And that's this kind of inner self, what Marcus Aurelius will call it, the inner citadel. The inner fortress. And part of Seneca's exercises, Seneca's hands on practical exercises for doing this, is to premeditate on future evils. He says this in a letter to Marcia. He says basically, you've got to imagine bad stuff happening to you. You've got to think ahead and imagine losing everything that you value. And once you do this difficult mental work, then you can be more prepared and more steeled so that when terrible things do happen, you don't lose your mind. Now that's very interesting. And that's one of the ways in which Seneca, especially in his letters to um, letters to Lucilius, gives something that seems of great use to ages subsequently, the exercises, the training in how to be a Stoic. Right, let's move on to part four on the shortness of life. Let's look at this interesting text and some of the key arguments that Seneca makes in it. Um, so this is one of Penguin's great ideas. So what is this text about? So we've been talking about Seneca at the end of his life. We looked at the letters to Lucilius. Now this is earlier. It's written to Paulinus, um, who we think is Seneca's father-in-law. And it's basically telling him to kind of, um, it's pushing, it's encouraging him to retire early. To retire early, to not be too consumed with business. So what is Paulinus' business? We get these references, he is the prefect of Rome's grain supply. He controls the grain, the food supply really into Rome. It's a very powerful position. It involves a lot of stresses. Now, on the shortness of life, um, we we don't know when exactly it was written, maybe in the year 49 up to the year 55. So this is the period in which, um, I guess, um, Seneca still hasn't come to um, immense power in the Nero, but he still holds a kind of fairly prominent position. What's it about? Well, the title tells us, isn't it? It's about time, isn't it? It's about it's about how we should use our time and how we should use our time well. So the problem is that we procrastinate. We get caught up in work. We think that work is more important. We think public life is more important. As a result, we put aside time for what really matters, which for Seneca is ourselves, is training ourselves, is reflecting on ourselves. On our lives and what matters. Now, Seneca said it, it. It's not that we don't have enough life. We've got plenty of life. The problem is that we don't use it. We don't live. So even if we were given an extra twenty years, or we were even made immortal, if we still lived in the same way of being preoccupied with public business and what other people think of us, then what would be the point of our immortality? So this is a book about trying to direct us. To using time well and it's full of you know wonderful and very quotable uh, phrases one of my favorites is this living is the least important activity of the preoccupied man okay let's delve into some of the arguments here and this is something that I like us to discuss before we meet again on Monday um so the book uh, I'm calling it a book but really it's quite short let's think call it an essay the essay the essay begins in this very engaging way. Remember, it's written in Latin. It's something that Seneca writes to Paulinus, but the expectation is it's, that it's going to be read and discussed widely among Romans. Um, is It's directed to us. It's, it's trying to wake us up. And it begins in this really engaging way. So I'm using the Great Ideas translation here by um, Costa. Most human beings, Paulinus, uh, complain about the meanness of nature because we are born for a brief span of life. And because this spell of time that has been given to us rushes by so swiftly and rapidly that with very few exceptions, life ceases for the rest of us just when we're getting ready for it. 
Now the problem here is that it makes it seem as if nature is in some way deficient. But this is what Seneca was challenge. We've not been let down by nature in any way. We've got plenty of time. Life is long enough and a sufficiently generous amount has been given to us. The point is how we use the time. He often uses this phrase investing, investing time. We don't invest the time well. We waste it in public business. Now, one of the memorable parts is where Seneca talks about retirement and how we put off doing the things that we really value and that we really want to do until we retire. Now, we can probably think of this in our own lives or in lives of others. Why is it that we wait until we retire before we do, you know, go on a round the world trip, say, or that we travel and so on? Why do we put off what we really want to do until later? We might not have that time later. So Seneca says, you will hear many people saying, when I'm 50, I shall retire into leisure. When I'm 60, I shall give up public duties. And what guarantee do you have of a longer life? What will allow your course to proceed as you arrange it? Arrange it? Now, Seneca gives these examples from Roman public life, like he talks about this very busy lawyer, or he talks about, in history, he gives the example of the Emperor Augustus, who's always talking about wanting to retire and take leisure, but then he gets caught up in military campaigns and public duties. Or even Cicero, Cicero, who, um, I don't know, who saw kind of through involvement in public life, the possibility of peace and prosperity, but was still kind of troubled by adversity all the same. The problem is with these figures is that they put off what really matters until too late. How late it is to begin really to live just when life must end. So there's something really clear here, isn't there? And what Seneca is saying in this quote on the screen. Don't wait too late. Why wait until retirement? If it's something that you really want to do in your life, why aren't you doing it now? What stories are you telling yourself about your indispensability? That means that you don't really fulfill what really ultimately matters. Now it's a bit reminiscent of a line from James D. Okay, that's not an expected reference, isn't it? Uh, am I going to get this right? Dream as though you'll live forever. Live as though you'll die today. This attention, Seneca tells us to, to live right now. Live right now. Now, in that sense, he's offering someone that's maybe kind of different from the middle star or the early star, who are more about this kind of training and and uh, scientific work. Here, Seneca is, is maybe taking some of those ideas, but he's putting them in a much more immediate context. Now, he's adding some innovations, okay? You'll have noticed this, that he makes a distinction between living and existing. Now, this is reflected in the Latin. Um, you have in Latin, vivere versus esse. Vivere, really living, versus esse, merely existing. To live, to properly live, rather than just to exist in distractions and public activities and so on. But where Seneca has a relation to the previous Stoic philosophy is in this defense of nature. Remember, the whole emphasis on living in accordance with nature, which is so important for the Stoics. Now, what Seneca is saying is that nature isn't wrong. Nature isn't bad. Um, nature is good. We waste what nature gives. And we need to think about human life, not in terms of how many years we've got or how much success we have, but it's in the philosophical life, in the private pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. He says that we need to kind of think about our lives in terms of a balance sheet or an audit. I mean, he's using that analogy for Paul in this because of his work and with the grain supply. But we need to look over our lives and think about what really matters. And he gives this thought experiment. Now, imagine if you could know how many years you've got left before you die. Just as you're able to scrutinise your, your own previous years, what if you could scrutinise your future years? Wouldn't you live differently if you knew that you only had two years or five years or ten years or six months left? We certainly see this when people are given terminal diagnoses. And how and um, what, what they do next. You know, for many it is about travel or it's spending time with family. There's that sudden attention to what matters. 
And so we get these interesting phrases in the text. Seneca says that we need to kind of overcome fortune, we need to climb over fortune, and we need to live immediately. Proteinus vive. Live immediately, live in the here and now. It's a bit like carpe diem. But carpe diem is different because that's kind of, you know, like seize the moment, whereas living immediately is kind of making, it's maximising this particular moment and the moments all around it in order to kind of study philosophy and learn. Now, there are some interesting remarks that Seneca makes about nature in this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them in great depth, but I'm just going to bring some to your attention. Um, so one place Seneca says that we shouldn't complain about nature. Nature is acted kindly. Life is long if you know how to use it. Um, and it gives these really kind of powerful examples of people that are kind of who don't live, they just exist. One man is soaked in wine, enough for sluggish revivalness. One man is worn out by political ambition. Some are worn out by the self-imposed servitude of thankless attendance on the great. Now <laughs> you can imagine Seneca talking about his own experiences there. This is a, this world of wealth, sensual pleasures, and the, and the empty pursuit of honour gets us nowhere. It's shifting. It's in constant. It's never satisfied with itself. Even you can hear my doorbell ringing. Uh, the philosophical life uh, ignores the door in order to teach philosophy. Um, it's about living over existing. That's what we lose track of. But when we're caught in the hoi polloi in here and now. He also uses this example of like water. Time is like water, water that flows through our hands and out of our hands. It flows. And when we think of living immediately, that is to kind of dive into the water. Seneca says that our lives vanish into an abyss. And just as it is no use pouring any amount of liquid into a container without a bottom to catch and hold it. So it does not matter how much time we're given if there is, if there is nowhere for it to settle. It escapes through the cracks and holes of the mind, or here it just kind of uh, goes down into kind of into the floor. Um, this is an image from Rome. Apparently, the Roman tap water is, is um, contaminated by lead, so don't drink it. But water is something that we cannot control; it flows through our hands. And at the same time, Seneca uses the example of water as this thing that we can, um, that we need to connect with, and flow with, and flow into life. This. Is what matters. Now, Seneca also encourages us to, to study philosophy. And these are some of the remarks that come to us later. He basically tells Paulina to retire early and to study the greats. Um, and who are the greats? Well, there's mention of Socrates, Aristotle is, is mentioned, Zeno, uh, Theophrastus, Democritus. So, what's philosophy going to teach us and why should we do it? Um, well, like, well, remember this material from last week about the way that the Stoics praise the philosophical life and what the wise man is the only one who is free and not a slave. The wise man has no, experiences no passions, is not subject to fortune. Now Seneca says that um, if it's only through the study of philosophy that we become, quote, really alive. Really alive. Now when Seneca talks about this real life being really alive, um, he also describes it as, as living in the past, which is a curious way of putting it. He says that we should study these ancient greats, and he's also talking about texts that are, some of which are available to us, like say by Plato, and some that are not. Um, Seneca says, quote, we are excluded from no age, but we have access to them all, and if we're prepared in loftiness of mind to pass beyond the narrow confines of human weakness, there is a long period of time for which we can roam. go back in time basically we can live with the greats and some of you might know this uh, another this f image that Machiavelli raises when he's doing his own work on Roman politics and history he says that when he was doing when he's writing on the Roman Republic he would often dress up as a Roman and here's Seneca we can go back in time we can we can argue with Socrates this we can do but what okay we can go back and they're encouraging an excellence they're encouraging a greater awareness of nature, but they're also encouraging a real detachment because living in the past is a detachment from the present. And this is where the Stoic philosophy of Seneca is, is more reminiscent of this aspect of the thinker by Rodin. With, the, think, with Rodin's The Thinker, I've wanted us to think of the instance of the thinker where he's in front of the gates of hell, where he's in front of other people. 
but we're probably more familiar with this image of the finger on his own. And let's talk here, let's think about non attachment or detachment. Let's think if there's something that, if there's a, we need to talk about masculinity with this as well. So this is what Seneca directs us to, quote, he alone is free from the laws that limit the human race and all ages serve him as though he were a god. Some time has passed. He grasps it in his re recollection. Time is present. He uses it. Time is to come. He anticipates it. This combination of all times into one gives him a long life. All times into one. There is no past, there is no future, there is just the now. The now where we look within and we turn our attention to philosophy. He also describes it as uh, leaving the ground. We leave the ground and we float up by implication. A ground where, quote, we pursue the love and practice of the virtues, forgetfulness of the passions, the knowledge of how to live and die, and a life of deep tranquility. Okay. Now, in this final part, final brief part, um, as we wrap up, I want to talk about Seneca's legacy um, and where we fit all of this wonderful staring stuff in with Seneca as an individual. So we've got, keep in mind here, the two Senecas, the good and bad, you know, practicing what you preach and so on. Now, one thing that we haven't really said much about, let's just mention it briefly, is why does so much work by Seneca survive, whereas by Z nothing survives by Zeno? Now, part of that is a mistaken belief that um, the um, medieval Christians had, that Seneca was actually a Christian, he was secretly a Christian. So Seneca's philosophy is very popular in the Roman Empire, and it's popular with early Christians. And then in medieval Europe, there was this belief that Seneca had wrote letters to uh, St. Paul. Now these letters turn out to be forgeries much later on, but this is the, the kind of, but this is the belief that he, he secretly won the the king, and that maybe all of this stuff about self-control and self denial can easily fit in with Christian motifs. We can see in this um, medieval image, I don't know what's from, manuscript, that three important philosophers, Plato, Seneca in the middle, and Aristotle. You'll notice that um, they seem to have copy and pasted <laughs> The medieval form, um, the faces of Seneca and Aristotle there. Um, so this Seneca survives by partly by being being a Christian. Now, how does Seneca differ from other Stoics, other Roman Stoics like Epictetus here or Marcus Aurelius? Well, one thing that's interesting about his work is that it's written for the public. Epictetus, we're going to meet him next week. He doesn't write anything, and his work is. Is, is basically transcribed by somebody else, by one of his students. Marcus Aurelius, The Meditations, is a journal that he writes for himself only. He wasn't, you know, it's not the expectation that it would be widely published and read. Seneca, in his own time and shortly after, is way more widely read and understood than other philosophers. He is the major Stoic in his time because of the very popular and accessible way that he writes, because of his place in the center of Roman culture, because of also the way that he writes in Latin. So keep this in mind too, that in some ways he should be the most important Stoic, at least in the Roman period, but yet nowadays we probably think more of Marcus Aurelius. Then we've got Seneca the tragedian. Seneca who produces these tragedies, taking Greek myths, and making them really visceral and really gory and really dramatic. Seneca who focuses on the passions and on the drama of the passions. How does that fit in with the image that I've had of Stoicism before being above the passions? of cultivating reasonable joy, but not, certainly not pursuing pleasure. This is what we might associate with Zeno. Seneca, who is very important to the early modern Europe, um, a key part of Justus Lipsius's neo-Stoicism, basically the stuff that ends up influencing Montaigne, Spinoza and others. So there are many Senecas, and there is a debate throughout time about good and bad Seneca. Let's end with a quote and then we'll end it there. Um, this is from Off Peace of Mind. And it's about fortune. And maybe one thing that we could agree on with Seneca's life is that it ex experiences rapid and very interesting fluctuations in fortune. And yet we still see towards the end of his life the same perhaps consistency of philosophical spirit. Seneca says, 
we should go directly in the teeth of fortune one should sorry go directly in in into the teeth of fortune and never will give way to her nor indeed has he any reason for fearing her for he counts not only chattels property and high office but even his body his eyes his hands and everything his use makes life dearer to us nay even his very self to be things whose possession is uncertain he lives as though he had borrowed them and is ready to return them cheerfully whenever they are claimed okay right so for discussion on monday dealing with our text first of all why does seneca argue that we misuse time then i'd like us to talk about what characterizes seneca's broader philosophy and then in the final part was seneca a good or bad stoic based on how he lived and based on what he taught okay we're going to discuss all this at one o'clock um just use the same zoom link as before and then next week we're going to look at epictetus um Late Stoa, Epictetus, very important for James Stockdale, shot down in North Vietnam. Now, with Epictetus, there's two key things that we could look at, either the handbook, the Enchiridon, Enchiridion, or the discourses. And I thought we'd look at the handbook. This is a handbook that was produced, which is um, a portable summary of what Epictetus thought, you know, for the, kind of, for the discerning Roman. Um, and it's like a digest of what he thinks. So we're going to look at that. But if you like this stuff, the discourses give a little bit more depth. Um, I will have it up on Moodle in due course and then if you have any questions or whatever just send me an email sometimes it takes me a little while getting back to you but I will get back as soon as I can right so this is it um, thank you very much everyone I uh, hope this was time well spent and thank you